once you get into it, it's it's hilarious. I've really never read anything quite like that. It really has one of the best plot twists in modern American literature. What is up guys? So this is a video that has been seven years in the making. I started reading Chuck Palahniuk back in 2015 with his debut, Fight Club, and have been absolutely mesmerized since then. Well, I don't know that I would say with all of them. After Fight Club, I basically decided to read all of his books in publication order just to see how his literary career has unfolded over the last two decades. Rolling Stone has referred to Polonek as America's most deranged novelist, and I would have to agree. He's a satirist. He never misses an opportunity to wax poetic about the follies of modern American life. He also tends to be pretty polarizing. You will see in a lot of reviews, people saying they were so disgusted they'll never be able to pick up another Chuck Palahniuk book again. You have to have a strong stomach to read him. I will say if you are under the age of 18, you need to proceed with caution with this video. I cannot be held personally responsible for your emotional trauma. That being said, he is pretty prolific. So this video is a compilation of the 20 fiction, I'm skipping nonfiction, novels, short stories, graphic novels that he has published since Fight Club, which came out in 1996. There will be timestamps below. I'm gonna try to sail through some of these pretty quickly. Without further ado, let's get into it. So Polonik's first book is, like I said, Fight Club, came out in 1996. The film, I believe, came out in 99, starring Edward Norton and Brad Pitt. It really has one of the best plot twists in modern American literature, in my opinion. I had somehow managed to remain unspoiled. I read this in my early 20s and I just didn't, I had never seen the film, I didn't know the plot twist, so I was genuinely very shook when I read this. It follows an unnamed Named narrator. He gets a lot of different names in the movie. His apartment catches on fire and that same night he meets a man named Tyler Durden. And Tyler is very charismatic. He's very much the opposite of the narrator in pretty much every way possible. If you see me glancing down it's because I have about a bajillion notes for this video. It's very much a commentary on modern society's fascination and obsession with materialism, with things. There's a lot of commentary on consumerism, anti-capitalism. One of the most famous lines is, Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes, working jobs we hate so we can buy shit we don't need. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires and movie gods and rock stars, but we won't. And we're slowly learning that fact and we're very, very ticked off. So I'm not much of a rereader, but I have actually read this book twice, which says something. If you take away nothing else from this video, just read this one. This is quintessential Polonic. You have to start here. You might as well not even talk about Polonic if you haven't read Fight Club. The next book Polonic came out with was Survivor. So this follows Tinder Branson. He is the last known survivor of a death cult. The story is actually told through a recording that he's playing while, while he's flying a plane that he knows is about to crash. He's essentially recounting his life story from when he was a child living in this cult to an adult who he sort of described as a roided out media messiah. This is one of Polonic's satire he really picks apart all the little nuances of American life that he finds kind of annoying. So he touches on the media, he touches on the idea of celebrity, pop culture in general, and this is a style that Polonix sort of become known for. He sort of uses the facade of a plot as a conduit to essentially give the reader his own opinion. Then we have Invisible Monsters. This is a queer novel about a fashion model who seems to have everything. She's got a wonderful boyfriend, a successful career, but an accident leaves her disfigured and her life really drastically changes because of it. She then meets a woman named Brandy Alexander. She's a transgender woman kind of dealing with her own struggles and through that friendship the main character learns to sort of reinvent herself as well. There is a remixed version of this. It was essentially Polonik's original version. I've not read the remixed version. That's the one in which Polonik kind of writes it essentially out of order I guess. I don't intend to read the remixed version because it's essentially the same story just in a different order. Polonik's fourth novel is Choke. Um, this is also a film starring Sam Rockwell. The plot essentially follows the main character who pretends to choke on food in fancy restaurants and then the person who comes along who always like knows the Heimlich maneuver and can save him he's able to mooch off of them off of their pity for like a certain amount of time um, and that's how he he makes his living he goes around to different restaurants and does that until um, the person who saves him kind of gets bored with him and then he also works at a colonial theme park um, and the movie's pretty pretty similar to the book it, it follows the book pretty well in terms of character development Victor who's the main character. He's pretty unlikable in the beginning. He kind of grows on you though, and I feel like there were ultimately some redeemable qualities that he had by the end. Next up is Lullaby. This was one of his better works. The blurb talks about a culling song. It's a lullaby sung in Africa to give a painless death to the old. The lyrics can actually kill. Um, and there's a book 
that the narrator finds. It's an anthology that's like sitting on the shelves of different libraries around the country. A reporter, Carl Streeter, he, he learns of the song's power and actually starts reciting it to anybody who annoys him. And as you can imagine, he racks up a pretty decent body count. So he kind of takes it upon himself, realizing the destructive power of this culling song um, to go out and try to find all these copies and destroy them. There's like a real estate agent buddy that he's got. She's got an assistant who's a Wiccan. Essentially, they end up on like this cross country trek to find all these books and destroy them. I do feel like a, a little bit of a problem with this one was that Polonic sometimes does tend to kind of go off on a ramble sometimes and the story feels like it loses its focus a little bit. This one does have paranormal elements to it. There's a haunted house, there's a bathtub full of blood. It's actually not nearly as disturbing as some of his other books, but I would categorize it as light horror. Next up is Diary. This one I was not a big fan of. I think I ended up DNFing this one actually. There wasn't anything about it that really hooked me from the beginning. The story follows a woman named Misty. She's basically stuck on an island. She was once like this rising star. Her husband has actually committed suicide recently and he's in a coma. And something that kind of happens is she, she sort of feels inspired again and she starts painting. Essentially there, what the blurb says is that there's like a conspiracy that starts to happen and it threatens to cost hundreds of lives. I didn't make it that far into the plot because I did not find Misty and her story really compelling. I just didn't feel anything for her situation. You know, I guess maybe I was supposed to pity her. I'm not really sure. Maybe that makes me a bit of a sociopath that I wasn't really feeling anything for this woman who, you know, she's kind of stuck and her husband's in a coma and, you know, she's obviously in a bad situation. Maybe it was just my, my headspace at the time, but I could not get into it. Next up was Haunted. So this one's a little bit different. Um, it was made up of 23 short stories. All the characters have answered an ad for a writing retreat that's going on. What they don't realize is that they've unknowingly joined this sort of survivor style TV show. The host has started withholding things from them like food and water. They get more desperate and so they each each person tries to tell the most interesting story and, and make their self the star of the show. So I would say if you're a fan of Survivor or things like it, you're probably gonna like this one. It, it is essentially a satire of reality TV um, and it's also kind of a nod to the horror genre. It gave me kind of Hunger Games, Lord of the Flies kind of vibes as well. Um, so if you like those, you might like Haunted. Polonick's next novel is Rant. It follows Buster Rant Casey as he runs away from his small town and joins the Demolition Derby um, and also becomes a serial killer. Those are not spoilers, that's actually all in the blurb. I think this was another DNF for me. I just didn't feel anything for him. If he doesn't hook me in the beginning, I just, there there were a few in here that I didn't quite finish. I maybe got halfway through and was just like, I, I don't care and I put it down. I know I've read some critics reviews and they've said that Polonix style reminds them a little bit of Vonnegut. Um, and other than Slaughterhouse-Five, I can't usually get into Vonnegut either. Maybe there's something there, some sort of, style of the prose there that I'm just not not jiving with. Next up is Snuff. I'm gonna preface this one by saying this is probably Polonick's raunchiest, sort of least kid-friendly version because this book discusses the adult film industry. So again, warning. The story focuses on Cassie Wright. She's an aging adult film star, but the story is actually told mainly from the talent agent, like the talent manager. And then there are three unnamed men um, whose perspectives we see. And I want to say it takes place all in like a single day. Like it takes place in a very short amount of time. It's also only like 200 pages. So at least by the end, if you find out it's kind of not really your thing, you haven't really wasted all that much time. Next was Pygmy. So this one's very different. I thought that I was going to DNF this one, but it's so hilarious that I, I definitely stayed through to the end. It's written in broken English. I was listening to the audiobook and they're like, I'll see if I can find a sample and insert it here. Passport man, officer nothing behind bullet glass, open and reading passport book of operative me. Matching to paper fax of visa, man down look upon this agent say, you're a long ways from home, son. Passport man say, so you're an exchange student? Man, Ancient, penned animal dying of too tall. Pooled heavy blood hanging in leg veins. Trapped all day, then could be, next walk to toilet. Pow, pow, clot, knock out brain. It's difficult to get through if you are someone like me and you really like descriptive language and, and like proper grammar. Um, it's a struggle to get into, but once you <laughs> once you get into it, it's, it's hilarious. And the way that his mind works, the way that the narrator is commenting on these, these different um, things about American life and the different words that he uses because he doesn't really know proper English is hilarious. I think it's one of Polonick's best satires. So it's told from the perspective of a handful of teenage radicals who 
have disguised themselves as foreign exchange students. The blurb says they're from a totalitarian state sent to the U.S. disguised as exchange students. Living with American families to blend in, they're planning an unspecified act of massive terrorism that will bring this big dumb country and its fat dumb inhabitants to their knees. And that's kind of a recurring <laughs> like line that you hear is this big dumb country referring to America. I, I enjoyed it. That one is, I've, I've really never read anything quite like that. So yeah, I feel like it gets points just for its uniqueness. Next up is Tell All. This one is kind of an homage to old Hollywood. Um, it's told from the perspective of a caretaker um, of a woman named Catherine, who's this aging movie star. She's kind of this Elizabeth Taylor-esque kind of character. Catherine has fallen in love with with um, a man who has honestly one of the most pretentious names I've maybe ever read in literature, which I'm sure is what Polonick was going for, Webster Carlton Westward III. He kind of weasels his way into Catherine's life, but Hazel, who's the, the caretaker, she's, she's pretty sus about him, and she finds out that he's actually already written a memoir that foreshadows Catherine's death. So Hazel knows something's up. All in all, I felt like all the name dropping of like celebrities who were at their heyday during like the 70s was not, I mean, I literally didn't recognize like any of the names Polonik was using um, and he name drops a lot. The plot was a little repetitive, not gonna lie. I feel like it tries to be kind of a modern retelling of the picture of Dorian Gray, but with poor execution. I know that's kind of harsh, but that's, that's what I felt like. Luckily, the next book, Polonik kind of redeems himself, so Damned comes next. Um, and it's essentially The Breakfast Club in Hell. So this was right up my alley, I loved this one. It was one of his darkest. There are definitely some, some dark stuff, as you can imagine. If you know anything about biblical descriptions of hell, then you know some, some things that um, the characters might bump into and see while they're there. So it follows 13-year-old Madison, and she wakes up in a cell in hell. And there's all these people who sort of represent a different archetype. And after she befriends these people, they decide to take her on a tour of hell because you know, it's her new home. So in hell, everyone has a job and she gets the lovely task of telemarketer, which I think is hilarious. So she has to call the living. She's supposed to charm them so much that they commit mortal sins and then can join her in hell. That's that's basically the plot. She actually becomes a top recruiter and she collects this like army of admirers and her new goal becomes basically overtaking hell's bullies. Adolf Hitler would be one of those, uh, bullies, Vlad the Impaler, etc. She ends up garnering so much attention that um, Satan himself becomes um, a character in the plot. So I thought it was quite, quite inventive and different. Um, basically like a really dark, sadistic version of The Breakfast Club, which is one of my favorite movies from the 80s. So I liked this one. It does end on a cliffhanger, but luckily the next novel, Doomed, kind of picks up where it left off. So Doomed is different because it follows Madison um, as her sort of form of purgatory changes and she starts to haunt her parents who were very neglectful when she was alive. It's kind of like a prequel that kind of goes back and explains like why she is the way she is. It's considered a duology. I don't feel like Doomed was really necessary. It wasn't really, it didn't really need to be written. It, yeah, it just, it, I know it ends, it ends on a cliffhanger and you do have some questions about Madison's life previously that Doomed does answer, but I was perfectly happy just with Damned, even though it ends on a cliffhanger. So next up is Beautiful You. This follows Penny. She lives in New York and she's single and then finds herself the object of affection for a man named C. Linus Maxwell. He's this billionaire playboy. Um, he's got a very interesting invention um, that she very quickly realizes she's sort of become the new test subject for. Things obviously go south when she realizes that's what he is like interested in her for. This one was another one where I felt like Chuck was really reaching. He was really reaching for something. This could have just been a short story instead of a novel. And it's another one that really polarized people if you read comments and reviews. There are reviews of this book that give it a one star and there are reviews of this book that give it a five star. I think I fell somewhere in the middle. I feel like if you if you approach it knowing that it's essentially a satire on gender politics, you will enjoy it more. You can't take personal offense. If you're somebody who gets personally offended really easily, you're not gonna like Polonic. You're not gonna get his stuff. You're just gonna be offended. So you really have to like kind of put your ego aside um, and go into his work with an, with an open mind. Next up is a very exciting one, the sequel to Fight Club in graphic novel format. So this one takes place 10 years later. So we're 10 years in the future. The narrator's life is looking pretty bleak. He's married now, he has a kid. Unfortunately, tragedy befalls him. I'll just leave it at that. I know that's vague, but I'm just gonna leave it at that. So I'm not gonna spoil anything, but he does find a way to cope. Honestly, I don't think a sequel was necessary. I feel like when you have something that's so good, 
I know that there's probably a pressure from like his publisher to expand on it because they knew it would be a money-making machine, um, but nothing's gonna top the book. It just felt a little bit like Chuck's kind of chasing that high, chasing that first high and, and, and trying to get as close as he can to the original. But we all know that sequels are rarely as good as the original, in my opinion at least. He even him inserts himself as a character. Like Polinick is a character in Fight Club 2. So there's like a scene in Polinick's like in a writer's group. I don't know. It was, yeah, it was just a little bit too meta for me. It was funny. The art was really cool. Art style is phenomenal, but I felt like the art was better than the story. So if you're into art and graphic novels, you might like to flip through it just because of that. Next up was another really cool one, Bait. Um, this is actually a coloring book with short stories within it. I'd never seen anything like this before. It's really interesting. So each story has scenes that have been illustrated and then you can you can color them in. I think it's a really unique concept. I think maybe Chuck's just out of ideas and somebody came up with this idea of, well, let's, you know, write a few stories, but then we'll we'll illustrate them and that'll be kind of like the, the new thing. So a few of the standouts from Bait are Mudslinger um, and then the title story as well. So the title story, a senator is murdered and the only witness um, is the goldfish that's on his desk in the bowl on his desk. So the city decides to bring in an animal whisperer to try to get the story out of the goldfish. Again, it's one of those situations where it feels like Chuck's, he's reaching a little bit. The fish is given like anthropomorphic qualities, which I honestly kind of find fun. I, I do like that. The story does manage to give off like film noir vibes. So I was, I was honestly pretty impressed with this one. Um, and then Mudslinger is about Reese Witherspoon, a website claiming to have photos of her poop. I don't know if he comes up with these ideas on his own or if he's just like sitting around with his buddies and I feel like it's like a story where you would like write random people's names and different things down on like pieces of paper and then like shake them up in a hat and just you pull you pulled out poop and you pulled out Reese Witherspoon and that's the story that you came up with. So nothing really compelling here in terms of plot, unfortunately. Basically Mudslinger follows um, Reese Witherspoon's management team like trying to track down the original photo and destroy it. These are two of the wackiest stories I've read by him. Sometimes it's fun to just move away from like very serious literary fiction um, and read something about fish that can talk in Reese Witherspoon's poop. If you're wanting to read something that's just so weird and bizarre and random that it, you know it's probably gonna keep your attention the whole time, then go ahead and read these. And then I guess Bait probably did pretty well because the next um, thing that Polinick came out with was Legacy. Um, and this is basically the same thing, except it's an illustrated novella. It's not a short story collection. This one follows a character named Vincent and he receives um, a very wealthy inheritance from I think his late father in the form of a bonsai tree. He, he runs into some trouble, right? Because he now has this thing of value that people want. But luckily help comes in the form of a 2000 year old archeologist stripper. She tells him her story of like how she be became to be and he learns why the bonsai tree is so, so sought after. There were actually several plot twists in this I wasn't expecting. And I remember, I think I gave this one like four stars. I was actually pretty, pretty intrigued by this one the whole time. The next one I remember being really excited for. Um, I loved the cover. I thought the concept was really cool. And then as I started reading, it just kind of lost me. So adjustment day came next. World War III basically breaks out and the American government's conspiracy to send all male millennials off to war because they're overrunning the world. Again, a satire kind of about gender politics. The blurb for this one says, in the near future US, a corrupt senator plans to reinstate the draft to send young men to die in a planned nuclear attack of mutually agreed upon destruction in the Middle East to prevent an uprising of those same young men. This one lost me pretty early on. I felt like it was lacking structure and he throws in so many characters that it's it's too many to really care about. Too many for me to follow, wasn't compelling. I ended up DNFing this one as well. This is when I started realizing, okay, maybe satires aren't really my thing because usually the ones that I have ended up DNFing by him are his satires. The next up was yet another Fight Club. So we have Fight Club 3, the masterpiece gambit. Just like it sounds, like it, it's a continuation of Fight Club 2. This time around, the narrator goes by Balthazar. That's his name in this one. He's away on business, busy cheating on his wife. He's having some trouble recruiting people for his latest project. So if you're familiar with Fight Club, Project Mayhem is a term that you hear 
later on in the book. This time it's an engineered flu designed for population control. Th things have gotten a little bit bigger this time and things get kind of weird in the end. It was very fantastical near the end, a little bit too, um, I don't know if it was like magical realism. Honestly, it felt almost too fantastical to follow. I think they end up like able to travel through paintings or something. Like they're able to like travel in and out of different artwork, if I remember right. It just gets to a point where you, you feel like he's milking Fight Club for all that it's worth. I don't really consider Fight Club 2 and 3 canon. I mean, they are, they're by Polinick. They're a continuation of the story. It's all the same characters. But when I think of Fight Club, I think of the book and the movie and I don't think of the second and third graphic novels. I appreciate the visual interest that the that the graphic novels provide, but they just get worse. Like Fight Club is like five stars. And then Fight Club 2 is like, you know, you gotta like knock it a star. And then by Fight Club 3, you're like, okay, that's like a three. And then now we are finally at his most recent publication, The Invention of Sound. This one again, I was, well, by this time I wasn't as excited. I didn't honestly have high hopes. I thought maybe if I go in with low expectations, then I'll be like, impressed. Sadly, this one was another DNF for me. I couldn't get into it. The characters were not compelling. I just, it just, it's gotten to the point where it just feels like, I don't know where he's getting his ideas from, but his, his publisher's like, okay, it's been a year or two. Like, what are we going to do? And he just sits and comes up with something. The blurb makes it sound like it's a story about a, a grieving father who's going to bring his daughter's kidnapper to justice. That's what it sounds like, but it gets really weird. I shouldn't be surprised at this point because almost all of Polonek's novels get really weird but the like the father ends up hiring an escort to like impersonate his daughter so he can like live out this fantasy that she's still alive he just ends up making some really questionable decisions ultimately I, I i i wasn't interested i don't even think i made it halfway through and i stopped reading all right guys that is it that is all 20 books i hope that you found <laughs> some recommendation in here i know and it does feel a little bit like he was on kind of a downhill trajectory again you cannot take personal offense to anything that he's writing people take things very personally nowadays and his writing really encapsulates a time before that was a thing. You just kind of have to keep that in mind if you're going to read him. So proceed with caution, but I hope you found some good recs, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.